Hello, I'm going to do um, <clears throat> a broadcast for this energy in class practice. Um, we didn't get to do as many in class as I wanted to or as I would have liked because we were doing stuff with the test. But hopefully um, going over these and explaining them in some detail will help you with overall understanding uh, so you can do your homework and do well on the test and that sort of thing. Let's start by not looking at me. Um, screen share. That'll do. All right. So I'm going to start with um, uh, the first problem. Seems like a reasonable place to start. And we had an object. It was there-ish, there-ish, and down here just before it hits the ground. So I'm going to say that's position A, position B, and position C. Um, let's see, it's a ball. The ball could have energy in it. And uh, it's falling because of the gravitational field. So if I wanted to look at this as a closed and isolated system, I would write ball and G field inside here. Remember from class, a result or a consequence of a closed and isolated system is that our total amount of energy must be the same, right? This is the, um, these are the conditions for conservation. And I'm also going to make a note here that there's nothing in the problem that says I have to have friction, so I'm going to ignore it. There's no air resistance here and there's no other friction. All right, so if I'm going to include this G field, that allows me to account for gravitational potential energy. But before I do that, I need to define where zero height is. And so I'm just gonna decide that that level there is my zero height. So as if the ball is separated from zero height, I'm going to have EG. If the ball is above zero height, I'll have positive EG. Uh, if I, the ball is below zero height, then I would have negative EG. Because all these gravitational potential energies are relative to wherever I placed zero. All right, so at position C, I don't have any EG because it's at position zero. At position B, I have some EG, and at position A, I have some more. So EG, gravitational potential energy, that's energy stored within the gravitational field when I have an object and gravitational field in the system, and the object is separated from my zero height. So that was just um, gravitational potential energy. Looking now at the kinetic energy, right, the energy associated with just the ball, well, the ball's not moving yet, so I don't have any EK. The ball's moving some, so I have some EK. Then the ball's moving its fastest, so I have the most EK. Now, in terms of the numbers, I just made all this crap up. I just decided that the total amount of EG initially was going to be four blocks. I could have picked five, I could have picked six, I could have picked any number. I chose four because it gave me a little bit of um, workability. If you look at position B, B looks to be more than halfway up, uh, maybe three quarters of the way up. And so all the way up would be four blocks of height. B would be three blocks of height, and C would be zero blocks of height. So that was kind of my reasoning for choosing four. And then since I chose a closed and isolated system, I know my totals have to be the same. So that's what I did. And now I can mathematize it. Remember, a closed and isolated system has this as a consequence. Total energy is conserved. Right, this is an energy summation, not a force summation. And I can write an expanded version that says the EG in the beginning 
is equal to the EK in the middle and EG together in the middle. And that equals the EK at the end. So I've got that as an option. This would be for a closed and isolated system with this idea of no friction. It's not the only way to look at the problem, though. So I'm going to make some changes. All right. What I'm going to do on this one is treat the G field as an external influence. There's still a gravitational field. I'm not ignoring the gravitational field, but I'm going to treat it externally. So it's an external influence and an external influence can perform work. And that just means my total amount of energy can change. So my gravitational field is now an external thing. Well, if the gravitational field is an external thing, I don't even see its stack of money or stack of energy. Sorry, I was thinking about the money example from class. Instead, my entire conversation is going to be about energy in the ball. And the ball is either moving or it's not. At no time is this compressed or anything else. The ball is either moving or it isn't. So it isn't moving, and then it's moving ugh, a little. Hey, you know what? I could use my pen instead of the mouse. That would be better. It should be better. Not the eraser, dang it. There we go. All right, remember that was moving some, and then it was moving some more. So I'm going from zero blocks to one block to four blocks, just like I had before, because I'm analyzing the ball's energy the exact same way as I was before. I haven't changed anything there. Instead, I'm treating the G field as an external influence. So the system had no energy, then it had one block. That's because the G field added one block of energy. We went from one block to four blocks. That's because the G field added three blocks of energy, according to my made up numbers. If I mathematize that now, I no longer have the total before equaling the total after. Um, instead, I have this. Total energy before plus any work done to get me from A to B is the total amount after. I guess technically we had the same thing in the previous example, but the work was zero, and that's why the total before equaled the total after. But anyhow, on this one, I don't have anything initially, right? There is no anything. I just have work performed by the G field, right? That's the influence to get me from A to B, and that equals EKB, and that's positive work. I also have EKB plus work performed by the G field to get me from B to C, and that's going to equal EKC. And again, that's positive work because it represents a gain of energy to the system. I don't have one equation that tells the whole energy story. Instead, I have an equation that gets me from A to B and a separate equation that gets me from B to C. There are things that are common to both, and so you could do some substitutions, but I don't want you to start with those. I want you to think of them separate first. All right, so that was number one the ball problem. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to treat the gravitational field as the system and the ball as an external thing. Uh, I can't imagine a time you would ever do that um, in, in my class, so let's not even worry about it. Now let's look at the bunny problem. All right, the bunny problem. 
we have a bunny. There it is. And then there it is a little bit later. And there it is at the end. So it says it's moving really fast. It's moving a little bit. And it's stopped. The things that could store energy, like the bunny itself, inside the bunny is a spring mechanism. And, well, there's got to be friction. Otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of sense why the bunny would slow down. Um, so I'm thinking there's got to be friction. That's, that's my system definition. I'm going to do an L, O, L, O, L for position A, position B, position C. And I'm going to use the exact same system definition. I want you to notice something that I've left out. I didn't write gravitational field on this. Now, that doesn't mean that there is no gravitational field force in the problem. It doesn't mean that the bunny is in deep space or something sufficiently far away from a planet that it doesn't matter. What it does mean is if I did include EG, I probably would have set that as my zero height, in which case the bunny would have zero EG the whole time anyhow. So as long as the object is not changing its vertical position, whether or not you include gravitational, the gravitational field, which would determine whether or not you get to include gravitational potential energy, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to leave it out. And now I'm going to think through, what is this doing? Well, the bunny is moving. So it has some EK. And then it's almost at the end of its motion. Eh, I'll say two. And that was five. So now I've got that. And now it stops. So I've got no EK. So this is five to two to zero EK. The bunny is moving fast. The bunny is not moving very fast. The bunny is not moving. So that's the trend with kinetic energy. Next, I want to think about the spring. What kind of energy would be associated with a spring? Well, I think it's elastic potential energy. There's some amount of E elastic because the spring mechanism is wound up. And as the bunny moves across the table, the spring unwinds itself. So it's going to be a decrease in that energy. It's a decrease in the energy associated with the wind-up toy. It is possible, although I don't know for sure, but it is possible that the thing is completely unwound when we get to the end. So that's the assumption I'm going to go with. The, the spring mechanism is 100% unwound when we get to the end of this. All right. I don't have any external influences. I don't think there's enough air resistance to cause the bunny to slow down. But there is some sort of friction. And I need my numbers to all add up. I need my total before, total middle, total end to be the same. Um, so how am I going to do that? Well, I'm starting over here with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And over here, I only have three, so I need six more somewhere. And over here, I need the rest. Well, what energy storage mode could we have to account for this? And that's E dis. Energy dissipated by friction. We start with none, because no energy has been dissipated by friction yet. Now, I want to point out that when we talk about friction, 
We can talk about a force of friction. We can talk about a coefficient of friction. We could talk about an energy dissipated by friction. These are all things that are related, but they are not the same. Kind of like with gravity and gravitational effects. We can talk about a gravitational acceleration, a gravitational field strength, a gravitational field force, a gravitational potential energy. These are all related, but they're not the same. So this energy dissipated by friction is a result of some probably constant amount of frictional force that is acting on this object over different distances. If you look at the distance from A to B, that's a bigger distance than the distance from B to C. So that force acting over a greater distance means or suggests that we would have a greater amount of energy dissipated by that force of friction over that interval. And when I mathematize it, EKA and E elastic A equals EKB and E elastic B and E dis B equals E dis C. I'm not even writing the other ones because they were zero. Similarly, I didn't write E dis A over here because it was zero. And I can write that one long run-on equation where something equals something equals something else because I have no work being done. There is no external influence to perform work. So the, the numbers are the same. Yay. All right, that's for the closed and isolated system. Let's see. Oh, nope, not going to work. Let me make a change. If I treat friction externally, and write it out here, right? this is not a frictionless surface all of a sudden, it just means I'm going to account for friction differently. Well, once I do that, I no longer can see the pile associated with EDIS. That's it. That's the only change. I can still see the pile associated with the bunny. I can still see the pile associated with the spring, but I can't see the pile associated with friction. And so I went from nine to three to nothing. Well, that's crazy. And that is evidence of friction doing work. Let's see, I went from nine to three. That means friction took out six. I went from three to nothing. That means friction took out three. And my equation's got to change too. Right? I no longer have energy as a conserved quantity. Now I have EK in the beginning and E elastic in the beginning plus work done by friction from A to B gets me EKB and E elastic B. And as a reminder, that's an arrow out, so that's consistent with negative work. Similarly, I have EKB and E elastic B and more work done by friction, this time to get me from B to C. It's going to equal zero because I got nothing over there. And that's consistent with negative work being done. The work done from B to C is negative. Specifically, I know it's negative three. That's how I got rid of these three blocks. But this would be how I represent it mathematically. But wait, there's more. We've got more options. What if I treat the spring externally Oops. So I treat the spring externally and friction internally again. Let's see what the consequence is. Right now, none of these are right or wrong, really, but there's consequences. So bunny and friction 
as my system spring as an external influence. Bunny and friction spring as the external influence again. Well, now that the spring is an external influence, I cannot see its pile of energy. It's gone. You could delete it from here down to. The EK is still the same, 5 to 2 to 0. I haven't changed anything about the motion of the bunny. The bunny was moving fast, then it was barely moving, then it wasn't moving. So that, whew, sorry, that part of the story is the same. It's not changing. Now that I've included friction back in, I'm starting from none. Let's see, do you remember the number I had in the beginning? Because I don't. What was it? What was it? What was it? Well, I know at the end I had nine. There should have been nine units there at the end. So if I have nine units there, hmm, what was it? Spring did positive work some amount. And here I'm supposed to have some EDIS also. Now I'm trying to remember the previous example. One, two, three, four, five. And there were four over here. And then I went down to two and one. And so there were six EDIS over here. Well, that's going to be the same. I should have six EDIS. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I went from one, two, three, four, five total to six EDIS and two EK. Well, that's eight. That's consistent with the spring adding three blocks. Now I'm going from eight to nine. That's consistent with the spring adding one block. And if you recall in the very beginning, which I had a real hard time recalling, um, but you could rewatch the video. In the previous example, the spring went from four blocks of energy to one block of energy. That's when we treated the spring internally. Well, that's a difference of three. Now treating the spring externally, we again see that three show up. And then from the middle phase to the third phase, like from B to C, the spring energy went from one to zero. Well, that's a difference of one. And now we're seeing that one show up here. And then we could write it. E, K, A, work performed by the spring from A to B. That's going to equal E, K, B and E, dis, B. And this work was an arrow in, so that's positive. Similarly, we have E, K, B and E, dis, B plus more work performed by the spring, this time from B to C. And that equals E dis C. Again, that's positive work. So I've set it up. I've looked at it a few different ways and analyzed it. So that's my bunny problem. You could, if you wanted, just treat the system as the spring. And what you would see is the spring decreasing its energy. And to be consistent with all this other stuff, it would go from 4 to 1 to 0. And we would have work being performed by friction. All right, that's our bunny problem. The baseball problem here, that one's coming up next. So we've got a baseball. And it's here. And then almost to the top. And then to the top. Then about halfway down. And then back to the same elevation. So A, B, C, D, and E. And I'm going to pretend in my interpretation that this is directly up and down. So not actually the parabolic path that they're showing. What I can do is define zero height 
as that height. Even though the ground is a little below it, I could define that as zero height if I want, and now the objects would have zero EG at both of those instants. Hooray! Let's start with a closed and isolated example. See, the ball could have energy. Is it a ball? Yeah, it's a ball. And we could have a G field. And I'm also going to say there is no friction. There's nothing in this problem that suggests I have to have friction. So my system is the ball in the G field. This is an L, O, L, O, L, O, L, O, L, right? This is for A, B, C, D, and E. An L for each. and an O between each. Inside that O is the same thing every time. Ball and G field. I don't want to say that you can never ever change your system midway through the analysis, but I, I don't recommend it. I think it'll mess you up with your accounting. So right now I have a closed and isolated system. There are no external influences. There's no friction. There's no nothing else. Um, so my totals should be the same. All right, let me think about what this object is doing. It starts at position A, goes to position B. On its way there, the object's going to slow down. Because when you take an object and throw it up in the air, it slows down, stops for an instant, and speeds up on its way down. Um, so I'm going to start with some amount of EK. Now, before I decide how much, I want to think about what kind of variation I need. Let's see. D seems to be about halfway up. B seems to be almost all the way up. If I start with 6, 6 EK, then... That I think is going to work for me because at the at position B I'm almost stopped at position C the object is stopped at position D the object is speeding up again and then at position E the object has sped up again to be as fast as it was going on the way up. There's a symmetry argument there that we've used in kinematics. So that's the kinetic energy side of things. Or you could have started with the gravitational potential energy side of things and said, well, at the very top is when we have the most EG at the halfway point we have half the EG. At the beginning and end, we have no EG, not because it's on the ground, but because it is at position zero. And then here, I'd have to find one, two, three, four, five, plus one is six. I think my numbers are working out. I'd have to have something to that effect. And I could write a big, long, run-on sentence. EKA equals... EKB and EGB equals EKC and EGC equals EKD and EGD equals EKC. Or sorry, E. Whew, it's a lot of stuff. So that's an option. The main option here, in terms of an alternate point of view, would be treat the G field externally. And if I treat that externally, I can no longer account for that energy. I can't see its pile of money. But I can still see the ball's energy associated with its movement. So let me just write down the word G field out here.
All right, so I've got the G field. Here I went from 6 to 1. Well, that's an arrow out of 5. It's a, a loss of 5 from the ball to the G field. Here I went from 1 to 0. Well, that's a loss of 1 from the ball to the G field. Now I went from 1 to 3. Well, that's the G field adding 3. And now I went from 3 to 6. Um, again, from the G field. And I could write to plus 3. These were minus 1s. You might also say that those are redundant because the arrow out tells me it's a negative. The arrow in tells me it's a positive. But this would be an option. And then I have a bunch of equations. EKA, work performed by the G field from A to B equals EKB. This is negative work. Then I have EKB and work performed by the G field from B to C equals, well, it equals nothing. That's another negative. Now I have nothing equals, nope, try again, nothing plus work performed by the G field from C to D equals EKD. And finally, EKD plus work done by the G field from D to E equals EKE. And now this is positive work and this is positive work, whereas the other two were negative. I want to cycle back to the idea with, of dissipated friction because we needed a force of friction acting across some distance in order to dissipate that energy. Here we have work being performed by the gravitational field force. So the force is pointing down the whole time. The gravitational field force points down. But on the ball's way up, so while the object is moving up, the direction of the force and the direction of the motion are anti-parallel with respect to each other. They're opposites. As a result, we get negative work done by that force. But then from C to D and D to E, the force points down and the displacement points down. So they're not anti-parallel, they're parallel. They're along the same axis and in the same direction. So that is a result of positive work, or that's how we might define positive work. Um, so that's just something to point out. That gives you the first three of these. In just speaking briefly on the others, for the ball example, it's rolling down. Let's see, slowing down. Would mean it could show up as a decreasing EK. If the ball is slowing down and it's a flat surface, I'm just going to make a note, flat surface, it's not an incline or anything, we don't need to include um, gravitational field force. We could just define zero height to be that height, and now there's no EG, so I don't have to worry about it. But it's slowing down due to friction. Okay, so friction is involved. It's a non-zero force of friction. And that means we could see an increasing E dis. From the first point to the second point it represents a bigger distance. So I would anticipate a bigger amount of energy dissipated from A to B than from B to C. All right, so that was number four. Looking at number five, let's see, a racquetball is dropped and bounces up and down. So this is kind of an assumption here. I'm going to just make this clear. It's only up and down, not side to side. Even though the picture kind of looks like the ball is moving sideways. The reason that's significant is if the ball was moving sideways, 
even at the top of its motion, it is moving still, which means it would have some EK. With this interpretation, where it's just straight up and down, then at all points, the ball is at rest or stopped. At all of those points, A, B, C, D, E, um, each of those five points. That means no EK at all. Now, there was EK in between those. So somewhere between A and B, the object moved. But I'm not looking at those snapshots. Instead, I'm going to be seeing a decreasing trend in EG when I look at A compared to C compared to E. Right, The ball's not bouncing quite as high. Um, and then I see compression at position B and D, which tells me there must be some elastic potential energy because the ball compresses and then expands. Why does the ball not bounce up as high? There must be some sort of friction. Now, where that friction is coming from can be really complicated. It could be air resistance, or it could be an internal friction within the ball itself. So when the ball compresses and expands again, the molecules within the ball rub against each other, and that's friction. So some energy is dissipated within the ball. One result here, if we did this over and over again, and this works like for realsies, I promise. If you take a racquetball, and you bounce it over and over and over and over again, the racquetball's temperature will increase. That increase in temperature is a way to measure the energy dissipated by friction into thermal energy, also called internal energy sometimes. You can do this as well. You don't have a uh, racquetball. You could get a paper clip. And then just wiggle a paper clip over and over and over again, and you'll find that that area that is bending over and over again gets hotter. There's an increase in temperature because you're dissipating energy into thermal energy due to internal friction. So that's an option there. Okay, neato. Let's talk about six. If you look at six, there's a spring. which means we could have some elastic only when the spring is compressed. So that's at position A, the object is compressed, so we would have some elastic potential energy. I would make sure, because it hasn't been done yet, define your zero height. It's easiest probably if you define zero height as the top of the spring in uh, the first picture. That way we start with only spring energy, and that's all. Um, and then as the object goes up, so it slows down. So if it slows down on the way up, that's going to be decreasing EK but it's going up, so you could show that as increasing, e.g., depending on your system definition, depending on where you put zero and stuff like that, we'll see some different values. All right, so that's that one there. Number seven, if you want to look at number seven briefly, we have a piece of clay dropped to the floor. Now, what's different? Comparing 7 to number 1. The object was at rest in the beginning. The object is falling down, and this appears to be about at the halfway point. So I would probably say half of the energy is EG in that middle point. Or I would have half the EG at that position compared to the original position. 
And then at C, the object is stopped. It's not right before it hits the ground. It's after it hit the ground and stopped. So this is after the, the clay goes and just squishes on the floor. But where's the energy then? This clay doesn't necessarily have that restoring force to bounce back up. So I don't think I'd call it elastic potential energy. Instead, I would probably look at this as energy dissipated by friction. Right? There's an energy cost to deform the clay. It just isn't going to reform and bounce back. So I'd call that e dis. Again, if you were to take clay and just move it a lot, it's going to warm up. It's going to increase its temperature due to the thermal energy that you've put in it. Right? The increase in temperature is evidence of um, energy dissipated by friction often. All right, so that should hopefully get you started on the basics of how to look at a problem and then also how to look at it in a few different ways. Uh, I want you to be flexible so you could define the system as closed and isolated or not. And that's up to you right now. Later, I'm going to try to teach you how to read a problem so you can figure out which system definition will make the problem easiest to solve. That's not my focus yet. My focus now is to get you to read a problem at all and to figure out how you might set it up. Try to figure out one or two, well, certainly one way, two or three different ways you might look at it and get all the way to the point where you are writing the equations. Not unlike unit two with forces, we had a diagram. We used that diagram to help us understand and then we built equations out of that diagram, out of the free body diagrams. So here we do energy analysis and write the equations. Those are critically important equations. You'll use those and some helper equations to do substitutions. All right, that's all I got. Hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, we'll talk more next class.